So delighted to welcome this evening our guest on the Rugby Chat, Dan McFarland, Ulster coach. Dan, you're very welcome. How are you doing? Good, thanks, Jay. Thanks very much for having me. Listen, let's be honest with the listeners. We have done this already. We were a few minutes into our first conversation and then the joys of Wi-Fi kicked in. I'm not sure if it was you or me. It's a very COVID-19 problem. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm actually a little bit surprised. I thought uh, we'd all be used to it now with uh, with Zoom calls and Skype calls, but uh, there, there, there we go. We'll manage. So listen, uh, to sum up where we were briefly, I had just, um, well, summed up your two years in charge at Ulster and there was that quarterfinal against Leinster last year in Europe. Uh, really brilliant uh, performance by Ulster was the general consensus and a Pro 14 semi-final defeat, which I know you were disappointed by. And this season, your second season, to lose a weight in European quarterfinal and your second in Conference A. So you have games against Connacht and Leinster from the 23rd of August. Two points there means you're in the semi-finals. And I'd asked you if you'd have taken that at the start of your tenure and the old winner's mentality came out in you. You, were, you, you probably wouldn't have quite taken it. You're always looking for more. Well, I, I think like the, yeah, the, the, the question has got to be answered in the, in the context of us having hindsight and, and we can look back and say, look, we, we might have done something a little bit differently. Um, you know, every, every time you don't get exactly what you want and what you want every, every year is to win trophies. You look back and say, well, well maybe if I tried it a, a, a different way. And in that context, you're all saying, well, no, I, I'd actually quite like another go at it. Um, but having said that, you know, as, a, as, a, as I say, we, uh, there, there were a couple of big games games there that, that ended our seasons in, in competitions. One was the Leinster quarterfinal where we really felt that we played pretty well and were beaten by a better team. And that's not to say we couldn't have won that game, but, but you know, we were beaten by a better team. And then against Glasgow, we were certainly beaten by a better team that day and we, we didn't play very well. Um, so that, that was disappointing. But none of that's to, to uh, put, put aside um, all the good work that was done to get to those stages. And there was, there was a, a lot of fantastic work done by uh, uh, the playing staff and, 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 and by the, the support team here who were who, who excellent. Name one thing you would have done differently. One thing I would have done differently. Well, I'll, I'll tell you. I think that in the in the approach to the semi final um, um, against against Glasgow, um, I think the um, there was possibly a sense of, of patting ourselves on the back a little bit too much after we'd beaten Connor at home and we'd had a home quarter final and, and we played pretty well in that in in that game and. and you know, perhaps there wasn't em e enough edge going into that Glasgow away game, and you know, I'm, I'm only talking um, uh, very, very small margins in what you're doing here. And when you arrive on on a Glasgow pitch, and and they do have that edge, um, played really well all season. They got absolutely thumped in their own semi final the previous year. They're playing for a home final against um, uh, uh, against Leinster. Um, it was always going to be a massive ask for us. Um, and, you know, whether we were going to win or lose, w w we didn't need to get um, knocked over by the first wave that came along, and we did. Um, and that, that that was pretty disappointing. So potentially spending a little bit more time preparing for, for, for that first wave as, a, as opposed to... Um, 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 well, not as opposed to anything, but mm. spending more time on that first wave, I think, was probably the key thing. All that said, the general consensus is you're doing a really fine job. And even the Leinster performance in particular at the Aviva last year caught the eye. And that form has continued in many ways through to this season. Knockout rugby again in Europe to come and hopefully a semi-final. Uh, did you feel from early on you were on the right track? with this group? Did it take some time? Because I'm sure you were finding your own feet. When did you start to think this is all moving in the right direction? And what criteria do you judge that by? Yeah, that's, that, that's a really good question. And somebody asked me that the other day as well. Um, I think that, 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 that coming in, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time trying to work out the context and understand the context of, of where the club was at that stage. And, you know, there was a lot of doom and gloom around the club and perception. Mm -hmm. um, I personally didn't see that. That's, that's why it's such an exciting um, organization to join and be a, be a part of a journey. Um, you know, they potentially weren't playing as well as they could have done, but 
they, they're in a really difficult spot at that stage, and, and people are having to deal with, um, you know, a, a lot of things off the field. Um, so it, 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 it was a question of focusing the mind and, and, and finding out from the people within the organisation, and, and, and also from my own perspective of looking at it, what, what was the most important question? You know, what, what was the first thing that we were going to address? Um, and, and we worked that out as a, as a, as a group. Um, I helped focus the mind on that, and, and you know, get get people to. Uh, um, um, believe in 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 that that key point and 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 then push that and i think it was probably after the first two or three games uh, that we played in that first year and, and we won two of those games in the last minute um that you know i, re- I really felt that my like, man we, we we've got a, a bunch of guys both on and off the field here that that you know, it really matters. You know, it, it really matters to them, and, and that's a foundation. Like that, that doesn't it doesn't win championships for you, but um, you can't win championships without it. Um, and that was that was a pretty critical moment. Yeah. Okay. And what about finding your own feet and feeling in yourself? Geez, I may actually kind of have the hang of this head coach business. <laughs> I'm still waiting, Joe. <laughs> I'm, I'm genu- genuinely I'm still waiting and you know that may be uh, uh, um, it might sound a little bit trite but it, that's it you just don't like the 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 first the first year it doesn't matter how much you prepare and I was a pretty experienced coach when 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 I arrived but as an assistant and you know I'd, I'd worked with a number of head coaches and, and obviously played under a number of head coaches and you know I had a wealth of, of uh, experience in terms of seeing people at, at, at work and in action and and in the last years as an assistant coach I spent a lot of time learning and, and uh, squeezing information out of those guys but. Really, when when it comes down to the position of, of well, you know, the buck stops here now. Um, it, 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 it's a totally different situation. Um, you know, you, you do stand um, uh, in a position where you're having to make um, the key decisions around that, and not just giving advice and thinking about it. And um, I think that was that 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 takes a lot of getting used to, um, and you know. Ma- making it a, a a a job where people around you feel as if they can supply advice, um, and it's not just can have to supply advice. Um, that's that's pretty critical, um, and I think I think I've. <laughs> I've found that much easier over the last six months, and, and then you throw in the COVID situation that that, that comes in there. Like, there's no settling. The, the the job I've done over the last six months has been totally five months has been totally different to what a normal rugby head coach would have done. It doesn't matter which head coach it was; they've all been doing a different job. So that's been a learning experience in in, in leadership and uh, and and adaptability um, that's been fascinating. Mm. I guess you're just across so much and you have to be aware of every small decision and the minutiae of, of the running of a, a, a 43 man squad. I think it is like I wanted to ask you, for instance, a couple of months ago, Jacob Stockdale came out and did a whole host of interviews. Really fascinating. It gave a brilliant insight, spoke very well. But he was talking about how uh, throughout much of last year, last season, he was reading social media nonstop for instance. So he talked about a game at Thomond Park where he said the first thing he did was go into the dressing room before he texted his girlfriend or before he got onto his family or checked in with anybody. He went onto Twitter to see what people were saying about him. Now he knew himself this was not a healthy thing to do and it was affecting his confidence. Um, But this is what he was doing anyway. Would you have been aware, for instance, that something like that is going on? Yes, look, you know, you, you, you have conversations with players um, um, the whole time. And, you know, at the time, it might not be the particulars of that. You know, Jacob didn't come in to me the following morning and tell me that he'd been um, looking at, at Twitter and it had uh, up, upset him. But, you know, you'd be aware of guys in terms of their confidence and, and you know, where they where they might be uh, struggling with their, their identity and... and uh, <sighs> You, usually, with how their identity is being affected by other people's perceptions of it, um, my my job in that is, and, and all our jobs, it's not just me. It's it's the rest of the support staff. Um, it's it's the rest of the players. It is to keep an eye out for that. You know, are people being affected by that? Uh, do they need support? And do they need particular advice? 
and you know we have a number of mechanisms in the um, in, in the club here that we would use to, to keep an eye out for just that kind of thing um, and you know that could be a conversation between myself and Jacob but it could equally be a conversation between Handy and Jacob right okay and do you like so say there's 40 plus players do you get you you can't get one on one time with each of them I presume across a given week how do you manage all that that, that that is corridor conversations. So, I will have a certain amount of sit down time with uh, um, with with individuals, um, dependent on what their situation is and what's going on. You know, it uh, you know often though those kind of conversations could be around selection. Um, they you know they could be along around long term prospects. It could be around all sorts of stuff. It could be around personal stuff that's that's going on on the outside. But the vast majority of conversations are, are corridor conversations where you know you're making yourself um, um, available as much as you can by walking around the facility, uh, checking out what you're doing, hanging around a little bit after training, uh, being there during warm ups. You know, when do when you get a chance to say hello to somebody and see how they're getting on? And, and, you know, if they've got something to say to you, oh, Dan, I just wanted to catch up on whatever. Um, or, you know, me spotting somebody who I might not have spoken to in the last couple of days and, and, and uh, uh, properly and, 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 you know, made a comment about their training or pick them up on something that uh, they've done really well Um and the previous weekend, and I think that's the, the, the those those kind of more informal connections are um, at least as powerful and, and more in, certainly more important than, than than sitting down with somebody for twenty minutes in an office. The moment the moment that you ask, uh, this is one that you learn as a coach. The, the one thing that happens as soon as you uh, um, uh, say, "Do you want to pop up to the office and have a chat?" They immediately assume that they're being dropped or they've done something wrong. Um, which is uh, uh, which is not helpful if you just want to chat. Um, mm. So uh, yeah, that's that's sort of how I manage that, Joe. Yeah, and is your relationship different with players now as a head coach? Do you have to be that bit more distant than you could afford to be as the assistant coach? I, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's a question of of, of distance. Um, I think it's it's just a question of the nature of the relationship. You know, it is not possible to alter the fact that there is a power imbalance in that relationship and I have to be really cognizant of that. So as head coach, you know, I'm ultimately responsible for uh, getting them um, uh, uh, for selecting the team. I'm also ultimately responsible for contracting or not contracting. So it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, you know, whatever that sits there. Um, in terms of in, in, in terms of an assistant coach is it, different. You know, the, the assistant coach uh, has a certain amount of responsibility and in, impact into selection and contracting, but it's not the same as the head coach. And also, they're dealing on a, a, a different basis there with the detail that they would go into on a day-to-day. So their relationships are really built around a lot of the detail that they're coaching and the specifics of what they're doing. So Roddy's relationship with Gareth Milosinovic. You know, there's a lot of it around is mauling their conversations are revolved around their um, their line out. And some of mine would be uh, involved in that with uh, with with Gareth. But it, there's also a much bigger picture that goes there um, in that relationship with Gareth and, and making sure that, that that there is accessibility, even though there is that power imbalance is 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 critical and not not always easy and you know it's, it's some 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 um people naturally do that really well and and other people have to work at it yeah i was reading i, I didn't realize that you have a degree in the classics i think latin and uh, greek potentially from your younger days and then interested in psychology and you, you ended up doing a psychology degree uh, does that come in useful in a practical day-to-day way being head coach of a rugby team do you find yourself harking back to semester three of your second year in college kind of thing <laughs> the, um, uh, no well not not in the not in the classics degree although um, um, you know I do know where to, to to look if I want to go and find something out about the Spartans um, who you know if you if you're a rugby coach at all then uh, having a good look at the Spartans and the movie 300 all the players love that so uh, that's that's worth following but not not really the psychology definitely Every yeah. day, as every single day, and it gives you it gives you access into exploring um, uh, different avenues, uh, um, particularly um, around learning and particularly around leadership. 
Um, so I, I'd be fascinated in, in both those topics. Um, you know, I originally started off on the on the path of, of wanting to be a teacher, uh, and I was sort of um, part halfway qualified as, as as being a teacher and worked as a special needs assistant before I started being a professional rugby player. So uh, the, the educationalist side of things is is, is a, a huge love for me, um, and would have spent a lot of time over over lockdown and when I was assistant coach for Scotland going into that side of the psychology um, and the, the the leadership stuff now is is critical if i'm not doing that I'm, if i'm not learning on that i'm actually not doing my job mm. uh, are there fellow co- fellow coaches who you can call up and, and and brains you can pick can you can you call joe schmidt and say can we talk about the breakdown is it that collegiate at your level it, 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 it is you know there's uh, um you know there's there's an, there's not much secret squirrel nowadays. Um, over over lockdown, I would have spoken to Joe. Um, I uh, um, spoken to Andy Farrell. Um, I would have spoken to uh, Paul Gustard. I would have spoken to Steve Borthwick, um, Andy Friend, Johan uh, Van Graan, Leo. All of these guys, I would have had conversations with. Um, you know, just just on the level of, of where well, it could have been leadership. Actually, it could have been rugby. Um, it could have been COVID protocols, um, but, and that, that's one of the interesting things as, as, a, as a head coach. If you're if you're an assistant coach and you want to to, uh, um, to chat about leadership, you know you can chat with your head coach, or you can chat with um, operations director, or or the other guys around that. As a as a head coach, there is nobody in the organisation that's experiencing the same things as as, as you are, because there's only one of you. Um, so you know, I, I, I have the ability and, and uh, to, to be able to chat to uh, Johnny Petrie um, around the organ- wider organisational stuff and the structuring and, and contracting, and with Bryn, obviously. But in terms of the actual head coaching job, there is there is nobody here um, who, who does the same job as me that, that that I can I can chat to. So it's absolutely crucial that I have outlets outside the organisation um, okay. to help me with that. That's great. So you can get on the phone and Leo and have a good old moan about referees in the media. I presume that's kind of the gist of it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have never, we have never moaned about the media, Joe, ever. No, of course. Uh, of course. <laughs> sure. um, so it has been, you know, very noticeable as well over the last, I keep saying two years, but it's been a strange second year, that you've really given youth its chance. Was that a conscious philosophy? I'm going to trust you that, you know, if there's a young player, I'm throwing him in or, or in, in many respects, has, has it been your only option but to do that? Um, well, there, 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 there's a bit of both. Um, the, the natural attrition that goes on in rugby obviously requires us to use more than the 42 senior players that we um, that we have. So guys, you know, unless you're ridiculously lucky, guys who are, are, are younger are going to get opportunities. Um but 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 there is definitely a policy around that. Uh, the the what what we're looking to develop um, in in Ulster is is around the growth of the club and the organisation. So sustainability over a, a longer period of time is really important. Um, we're really lucky um, that there are a lot of guys, um, young younger guys who are coming through who who show talent. Um, and you know they work very hard, and and it, it, it's exciting to be able to get those guys onto the pitch. Um, you know, and and we balance that with give it, giving younger guys opportunities with 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 the fact that we're in the business of winning matches. Um, mm. no, no, nobody gets selected here for nothing. You know, you have to earn your spot, and earning your spot might mean being ready when somebody else gets injured. Um, but whatever happens, when you play, you've earned your spot. You've got these games coming up now, and as I understand it, there are no warm-up games. There's no anything. It's straight in and, and business end of winning points and getting into knockout uh, matches. So uh, very interested to see how they'll go. I'm sure everybody is. One, because of the lack of warm-up games. So I don't know, can anybody be at full match fitness or match sharpness? And secondly, in a game like rugby, where it's physicality and it's adrenaline and the crowd are a part of that and a real part of that and the atmosphere is a part of that, you know. Um, it's hard to know what to expect. What are you? What are you? What are your thoughts on all that? Yeah, well, I'll tell, I'll tell you the second point first on on the crowd side of things. Like, you know, we're 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 doing a fair bit of training inside the Kingspan Stadium here, 
Um, and we were actually just discussing that today. You know, what's it going to be like in Aviva with nobody there? Um, I think the the Irish Cup final of the other day was lit, littered with with swearing over the referee's mic. Now, um, you know, <laughs> they'll have to do something on a rugby field as well. So uh, um, it's, it's often not the not 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 the, the the cleanest vocabulary that's used out there. Um, so that, that that that's going to be interesting. Creating your own atmosphere and understanding that uh, um, uh, the, the the job you've got to do remains the same, whether there's people in the stand or or, or on the TV. Um, in terms of preparing for um, games immediately at the start of the season, that that is really interesting. There are no pre-season games here, and normally what would happen in pre-season games is that the the, the first game that you go into, guys are playing. You know, they're, they're, you might go in with a squad of 30 and, and, and normally guys play 40 minutes. They might play 60 minutes at, at most. But we're going straight into a game that's completely competitive where at least seven of them are going to play 80 minutes. Um, so the preparation for that, we're in uncharted territory. Um, now, you know, we've, we've got a lot of experts um, um that, that, that we can tap into here, um, and you know they're, they're they're doing a really good job. They've got a really good plan, um, but the bottom line is it, it's pretty much uncharted territory. Um, yeah. So it, it'll, it'll it'll be an interesting one. And I, I I'm just presuming it's not possible to generate the same amount of adrenaline when there's not a crowd there. Um, sugar, I don't know. Um, you can I ask your S C guy later. <laughs> yeah, well, I think yeah, I think I think that um, I'm just just trying to think back to when I was playing, which a long time ago. But I, 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 you know, there've been lots of games when when I when I was playing that where you don't really notice the crowd for chunks of the match, but right. then when when you really need them and they're getting behind you, you do notice them. So yeah, I, I, I guess I guess they would be like here, here at Kingspan. Uh, for instance, if we're, we're when we're playing in big European games and the, the, those tight moments come and um, stand up for the Ulsterman is, is is roaring out over the over the pitch um, as you're running to a line out five meters from Racing's line, I have absolutely no doubt that 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 when I think about it that that adds to the adrenaline of it. Um, so the, the the replacement of that with a silent crowd is going to all have to be about what we're trying to achieve and what we need to do. Yeah. Uh, so, so Connacht are on the horizon. Obviously, you're no stranger to Connacht. It's it's funny you you, you talked a moment ago about how maybe you were going to go into teaching and then rugby comes into your life and suddenly you spend what six years playing at Connacht, another nine years coaching there and across Ireland. Um, it's it's funny how life goes. What did you take from that whole experience? It's a considerable part of your life spent in Galway. Yeah. Oh, look, it's. Uh, you know, it was, uh, I, I, I loved it in Galway. My 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 son Thomas was born there. Um, my daughter Alex and, and Thomas grew up there and did the the vast chunk of their their schooling there. And we we got a lot of uh, really good friends who are who who, who are still there. And it, it, it was it was interesting because when I when I arrived, I uh, um, as a as a player the previous year, um, I, I was at Stade Francais, and you know, although I didn't play as many games as as I would have liked. Um, we, we'd won the French Championship that that, mm. that year, and when I arrived in Connacht, well, I think we had the eleven full-time professionals in the squad, and you know, full-time professionals was a loose description of what we were at the mm. time. Um, but geez, there's, there, there was so much passion and so much heart, and, and you know, the, the, the coach who was um, um, there then, he arrived at the same time as me, Stefan Els. Um, a South African guy, and he, he's Steph, Steph was old school, uh, but it was exactly what we needed. It was exact. It was time and place. Like the context was perfect. Uh, he, he whipped us into shape um, and and put put us into a pretty good position to to naturally move on to the Michael Bradley era. And Michael Bradley moved us on as well. Um, I, I reckon that the, the biggest thing I learned, Joe, in in Connor was that that. It doesn't matter what happens at the weekend. You have to be able to enjoy your job on a Monday morning. Um, and right. fi- finding how to do that is, is a 
huge part of, of your own sustainability in professional rugby. And I, I would I, I, I would say that that's that's important whether you're playing at, at, at Leinster or, or you're playing at the Kings. It you, you still have to because professional rugby, even if you're at a, a uh, one of the winningest clubs like Leinster, it still has huge up and downs. Um, so you can't measure your your life's enjoyment um, on whether you've actually won at the weekend or not. It's got to be something more than that. Your purpose and, and your drive every week has got to be something more than that. And so how do you do that on a Monday morning? It's, it's, it's development. It's learning. Um, a- absolutely 100%. Because whether you've won in a historic victory or whether you've lost and you've played terribly, there's always something to get better at on Monday. So if you turn up, and you can't stop, you know, it's not that you're going to be miserable, or sorry, not be miserable if you play terrible, but you can you can come in on a, a, a Monday morning with that feeling of, yeah, I'm, you know, I, I've taken a massive kick in the groin here. Uh, I'm really down about it, but I'm telling you, when I go home at the end on Monday, I'm going to have achieved something. Um, and even if you're if you're five percent better at the end of that Monday, you, you can sit down and say, "Well, yeah, I, I've, I've actually done it today. I've actually got better. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm more likely not to suffer that again the next time." Because let's face it, we all suffer setbacks, don't we? Yeah. Well, listen, no, no kidding. Um, just a last point. I saw it with all the the youth coming through and all those young players coming through. You bought in. Albie Matheson, who Munster fans were, I'd say, were very sad to see go. And Ian Madigan has returned as well. Is Ian Madigan coming in, Dan, as very much a, a 10 and that's what he wants to do now for the remainder of his career? Or will he be moving around that back line a bit? Look, look Ian's a 10. We, we, we signed Ian as a 10. Um, right. You know, Ian's obviously a very talented player and, and has a certain amount of versatility, but uh, he's he, he's definitely here as a as a ten to give us a little bit of experience um, in the in the in the same way as Albie's here as a, 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 a nine and to add experience to our halfback stocks. Very good. And lastly, I was just reading a quirk of of circumstance. Your grandfather's from Belfast. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is. He was. Uh, um, he uh, he grew up here and, uh, and 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 left to go and study in the in the UK as a, as an engineer. Um, he he played a bit of rugby over here. He uh, he was he was a Gaelic footballer as well. Um, but uh, he, he died when I was ten. But uh, I, uh, I I loved him. Him. He, he left me with a love for Irish rugby. Him. Him and my dad. Um, what, what, watching watching grandstand uh, and, and Ireland playing um, back in the eighties um, on a, on a Saturday during the Six Nations, Five Nations was uh, was 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 my upbringing in rugby. Okay, and so who were you made support? Uh, what country wise? Yeah, Ireland always. No, no, no question. No, no turning around saying I'm. No, I'm, I'm never. Gonna... Never, never, right. never. No, it's, it's, Joe, Joe, it's an issue that, that that I've always had on a rugby identity point of view. I've got an I've got an accent that sounds like I should be reading the news on the on the BBC, <laughs> mate. But uh, I've always been an Ireland supporter. Right. Okay. God. And and I guess the kids would be the same then if they're Galway. Yeah, my, 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 my son my son's blood runs green, mate. So. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. He, uh, he 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 has Ireland flags everywhere. Right. And did your dad play rugby? Yes, yeah, my, my dad, my, my dad was actually a um, really, really good player. He played for London Irish, um, right. Headingley. He was a he was a centre winger, goal kicker. Um, wow. Um, and how did he, how did he, he end up with the prop, son? <laughs> <laughs> Fed me too much. Um, <laughs> I, li- I like I like to tell people when I was at school, I uh, um, I scored a try in the Ross school Ross and Park school sevens from eighty meters out. Nobody ever believes me, and of course there was no video back then, so uh, <laughs> I can get away with that. But uh, it's actually true. Oh, well, very, listen, I don't doubt it. It's very good. I hadn't, I hadn't realized realized all that. Um, listen, we're tight for time, and and you've been more than good. And we sort of had to do this twice at the start as well, courtesy of Wi-Fi issues. So. Thanks so much for the time and the very best of luck come August. And then as we might try and grab a word sometime around a European Cup quarter final if, if, if you're free. But in the meantime, Dan McFarlane, thanks so much. No problems, Joe. My pleasure. Thanks very much.